Hello everyone, this is Erica Podest. Welcome back to this RSET webinar series on the use of SAR for assessing disasters. Today is the third and final session of this three-part series. It is focused on the use of SAR for oil spill detection, and our guest lecturer is Dr. Malin Johansson, who's an associate professor at the Arctic University of Norway. She's prepared a great presentation for us today, which I'm very much looking forward to. Welcome, Dr. Johansson, and thank you very much for sharing your expertise with us today. So uh, thank you very much for having me. My name is Malin Johansson. I come from UIT, the Arctic University of Norway, so way above the polar circle in Europe. And today I'll be talking to you about marine oil slick uh, detection using satellite images. So uh, at the end of today, I hope that you will have learned a bit more about the mechanism behind why we can detect marine uh, surface oil slicks, how SAR images can aid cleanup procedures, and how we can derive slick characteristics using single dual and quad polar metric SAR images, and how satellite images can fit into the larger scale picture when it comes to oil spill detection and drift patterns. So we have two main applications for SAR remote sensing of oil spills. Uh, we can use the images to aid cleanup operations and for ocean surveillance. And with the latter here, we mean oil spill detection of both accidental spills as well as illegal discharges. And if we want to put this into numbers, in 2021 in European waters, there was a little bit more than 3,000 potential oil spills uh, reported by the European Maritime Safety Agency. And at the same time, the Kongsberg Satellite Services, they detected a little bit more than 11,000 potential oil spills across the world. So these are the numbers we are, we are talking about. So marine oil spills, where do they come from? Well, they come from uh, pipelines, wells, also transportation vehicles, storage tanks, and also something that we cannot do anything about, the natural seepages. So we often separate between uh, oil slicks and oil seeps, where seeps are the naturally occurring types. And oil spills, they often occur in coastal waters. And for that reason, it's important to both detect them early on, as well as convey information to responders so they can respond to the accident quickly. And once an oil spill has occurred, the, in the marine environment, they will be mixed down, but they will also be transported away by winds and currents, away from the original point of origin. And as it gets transported away, we don't only need therefore to detect the slicks, but we need to monitor the drift pattern and how they spread over time. Particularly we are in, when we're in coastal waters, because the oil slick may be on its way towards uh, the coastline. So we're primarily today going to talk about how we can use synthetic aperture radar for the oil spill detection. But these are not the only satellite data that we can use for oil spill detection. And each of the different types of satellite data have their own advantages and disadvantages. So here we're first going to look at a optical image where we can see there on the left. This is from a, a Santa Barbara area and where we can see um, the slicks quite clearly here. There's an a circle in area with a red rectangle, which we can see then highlighted a bit more to the to the far right. And the optical sensors are advantageous because with a good viewing angle and a favorable sun angle, the colors can be used as an indication of the thickness. So we can then not only get the aerial extent, but also the volume of oil that we're looking at. But the temperature is also an important parameter because a slick can induce surface temperature changes. And here we can then use the thermal infrared images, as we can see here in the middle. The infrared images, they can not only detect the slicks, but then also can indicate somewhat how thick the oil is. And during the daytime here, the thicker part of the oil is cooler than the surrounding uh, surface water. And again, we can then get the oil volume. And you can see here uh, in the far right, there has been some estimates on how thick the oil slick is based on these optical and infrared images. But these images are hindered by clouds and fog. And depending on where you're located in the world, this can become more or less of a problem. 
So I come from Norway, where we have an extensive cloud coverage in our coastal regions. And living that far north above the Arctic Circle, we have two months of the year when we don't have any daylight. Relying on optical images is therefore not an option. And an oil spill can also occur during night, even in areas where we do have daylight during most or at least half of the half day. So for operation and monitoring, we need a sensor that is not hindered by clouds and fog and is daylight independent. And here is where the synthetic aperture radar images comes in. You can see such an image here on the right. It's a radar set two images and you can clearly see that this dark area as being an oil slick. So I did say that there are all the sensors have some advantages and disadvantages and the actual thickness is something that we cannot derive from the SAR images. But what we can do is a valuable tool for detect and monitor the marine uh, oil spills. So let's focus here on what they can be used for. So we have here on the left an image where we monitor known oil spills. So areas where we know that there's an ongoing spill operations, some of the satellite sensors can be targeted to monitor this area with a higher frequency. And this I talk about in a higher temporal frequency. And they can also be used to detect accidental and intentional spills such as the image seen here on the right. And what we get from the SAR images, they provide us with position uh, where a slick is detected and which time it is. And by having a time series, then we can start talking, also deriving information about the weathering effects. And with the position, we can then also estimate the proximity to land and how close the slick is to vulnerable uh, areas. Some of them can be on land, but there's also areas where we have a lot of uh, bird breeding colonies, which may be in the water. So it's not just to protect the land, but also other vulnerable areas at sea. We can get the aerial extent from the SAR images. And because SAR images are also used to detect ships, we can sometimes identify a possible source for the, for the oil spill. So oil spill detection would be very easy if they always came in the same location and they always look the same. Here you can see five different uh, SAR images and none of these slicks look very similar. It's a little bit like the snowflakes. So, but you can actually see in some of these images either ships or for example, oil platforms where uh, oil is being released from. But not the two of these slicks look the same. And why is that? Uh, well, first, the volume of the oil that's being released is not consistent. Um, sometimes there will be a small volume of oil being released, but maybe with a very high oil concentration. At other times, there will be a mixture of open water or water and oil where you might have a quite low oil concentration in the said, but there will be a high volume. And here is an example on the right how the slick can also change over time because currents and wind will drag the oil away from the point of origin and depending on how strong the currents or the wind are the direction and strength of this uh, how fast it drifts away will be uh, changing this here is from an exercise on an annual oil and water exercise in uh, norway so every year uh, under control conditions oil gets released into an environment to test both cleanup procedures uh, test new equipment and also to monitor this, the development of the slicks using satellite images and sometimes also ra uh, radar data from airplanes and uh, also infrared and optical images taken from plane. You can ask why is it important to release oil intentionally into the environment? Well, some of these instruments we can only really test uh, so far in a laboratory experiment but at some point you need to test it in the real world so that in case there is an, a large accidental spill all the procedures are in place and also all the equipment has been tested under those conditions that we would often be faced uh, with should there be an accident because accidents seldom happen on those nice sunny days. But here um, there is a both a mineral oil spill or a mineral oil slick being released here and there's also a vegetable oil because we don't like to release mineral oil into the environment if we don't have to. So a long, uh, ongoing debate has been trying to find a vegetable oil of some sort that behaves in a similar fashion to a mineral oil. This is not as easy as we like to think. Uh, but here the bottom slick that you can see is the mineral oil and the top one is the vegetable oil. 
And you can see that both of them change over time, though not necessarily in exactly the same way. But overall, uh, the slicks in their infancies are located in little small dots, and over time they expand and uh, drift downwind. And we can then use exercises like this uh, for oil spill response with specific examples for tracking the slick extent, the position, and the weathering. And we can also use them to determine zones of relatively thicker or more emulsified oil within a slick. So I mentioned a few words, and I'm trying to go, gonna go through them one at a time. So the oil properties change over time due to the weathering processes. So how does the oil sort of gets diluted or mixed down into the water column will depend on the oil properties in the first place. What's the viscosity, the density, how solvable is it? And you can see some of this in the pictures. So there will be, the weathering will depend on oxidation, evaporation, dispersion, biodegradation, as well as sedimentation, ultimately. Um, and the weather will depend said, on the oil properties and some of the oil might have a higher viscosity and are thicker. Um, and this also will depend on then the air and sea temperature. So the colder the weather is, the more difficult it is for the oil to uh, be dispersed and uh, gets removed from the sea surface. A higher temperature will ensure a faster weathering process compared to the colder climate. And then for the spreading, the mixing uh, and mixing the wind and the sea state and the currents will affect how fast the oil is removed from the ocean surface. So synthetic aperture radar is, is good for detecting the oil under a lot of different conditions, but there are challenges. So I remember I talked about the disadvantages. So the major challenges for SAR oil spill detection now is how to use the effective spill response, remediation and restitution of accurate oil thickness measurements. So we know that thin oil evaporates fast and thicker oil with a higher viscosity lives longer on the surface. But SAR images cannot be used to derive the actual thickness. It can be used to derive the relative thickness and we will come back to that later. But we also need to know the short term forecasting of the oil transportation. And this is also somewhere areas where we're still having ongoing research to see how the oil can be transported away in the in the short term. And this can be helped if we have high frequency of satellite images covering the area because then we can follow them or we might have to try and model them. In order to have good uh, volume uh, or good forecasting for how the oil gets transported away we need to know which volumes we're talking about and the release rate if it's a continuous release. And ideally we'd also need to know the oil type and properties as well as the oil type characteristics. And these are all parameters that we cannot derive from the SAR sensors themselves. But so let's now go back to a little bit. So oil slick detection with SAR images, how does it actually work? So the oil slick shows up in the SAR images from all platforms as a relatively dark area, often contrasting with the radar signature of the surrounding water. So SAR images, when I said all platforms, they can be mounted on airplanes, they can be mounted on satellites. And we also have uh, radars, not synthetic aperture radar, but radar mounted on a lot of the oil, operational oil spill platforms because they want to monitor their surrounding. In case something should happen, they want to be the first to know. So the way the radar detects the oil is to have a reduced signal amplitude, primarily through dampening of the small scale ocean surface roughness. And the smooth surface means the less signal gets returned to the satellite or the airborne platform. And the roughness is also frequency dependent and we have different frequencies for the SAR sensors uh, that are presently flown in space and also on plane. And those range primarily from sort of X band to L band when it comes to oil spill monitoring. And this is true both for the radars situated on platforms themselves, where they tend to favor expand uh, radars, but also from the airborne sensors. So the SAR sensors, they operate in either horizontal or vertical polarization, and they come in the form of single polarization, dual polarization, and also quad polarization images, or fully polarimetric images. We can use all of these polarizations for oil spill detection though the highest return power is given in the vertical polarization return, so the so-called DV channel. So 
transmit in the vertical and receive in the vertical. So this is where we have the highest uh, radar response. This is followed by the, the other core pole channel, the HH channel, where we have horizontal transmit and horizontal receive. And after that, we have the cross polarization channel, the HV1. Going to the cross polarization channel comes with its own uh, problems. So let's just see a little uh, sort of a click through animation here. But we have then see what it looks like. We have the capillary and short gravity waves uh, generated by the wind. You can see the wind here is an arrow on the left. And we have here a SAR sensor in space. And you can then see some distance ahead here. The SAR sensor receives a signal back from the uh, from the waves where the capillary and short gravity waves are what's really uh, giving that bright backscatter return. And you can see here the response uh, in the upper right or middle of the image where you can see a slight wiggly line uh, with a variation that varies because the waves are varying in space and time. So the ocean contains a spectrum of waves from short ripples of a few millimeters to waves of 100 meters length. In the absence of long waves, the ocean backscatter within a typical SAR angles, so 18 to 50 degrees, is dominated by brag or resonant scattering. The backscatter arises from wave components that are resonance with the incidence waves and the small capillary and short gravity waves. And according to the Bragg scattering theory, the backscattering processes is mostly due to surface roughness. And this is why many film detection algorithms are based on a thresholding technique. So if we move now the satellite sensor a bit closer to the, uh, the oil slick here, we get into the thinner part of the oil slick. You know, hopefully you notice there's different in thickness here. And once we get to this thinner part, there's a reduction in the response where much of the radar uh, return signal is away from the satellite sensors. And you can see on the response also here, we have a lowering of the response back to the SAR sensor. And moving then to the thicker oil, we can see that the response is even lower and more of it is now scattered away from the satellite sensor. So the response has dropped even further. And once we then move past the oil spill, the response uh, signal comes back up again and you can now see that we're back up to the area where we were before we monitor the oil slick itself. And if we then look at what is the SAR what can the SAR see? Here we have one of those oil slicks coming back to us again. And you can see here that the, the low backscatter areas are um, dark in this SAR image. And this is what a SAR image then looks like after it's been monitoring an oil spill. So I started hinting at the thickness here is important. We want to know how thick it is and how can we do that? Well, the SAR signature changes all is sensitive to changes in the dielectric constant as well as the roughness. But let's start first with the open water where we see that the surface is a high conductivity and you could see we had an, a high backscatter response to the SAR sensor. When the surface is covered by thin sheen, so this is a very thin um, oil slick, it is a change in the dielectric constant, but it is primarily the change in roughness that we can actually see in the SAR sensors. We need to move up towards emulsions, which is a mixture of uh, oil and seawater. And here, this, the, the oil slick is thick enough for a result in a new dielectric layer. And the scattering is altered not only as a reduced roughness, but also because of changes in dielectric constants. I've talked about the fact that we would like to know the volume uh, of an oil slick. And that we can now see something about the change in the thickness in the SAR sensors. And we know that there is a difference in thickness exists within the same oil spill. Not an whole oil spill does not look the same at all times. It will vary, and particularly in the center part of an oil slick, where we, that's where we have the thickest oil. But in order to have now an efficient recovery, we need to know where this is. In optical images, we can use the so-called bond code agreement. A bit of caution here is that the bond code appears only in fresh oil. When the oil has gotten very old and it's been weathering, it is not very easy to connect the color of the oil to the actual thickness. But 
so you can see here on the right, we have some of the uh, thicknesses uh, related to the color that we can see in an optical image. So we have here the, the sheen, which is the silvery gray. This is the thinnest of all our oils. And that's where you said the dielectric constant hasn't really had a chance to change yet. And then you move on to rainbow, which is slightly thicker, and then towards metallic. When we come to metallic, this is normally corresponding to true color or emulsion, um, so we, where we can actually see the oil. It starts looking that brown uh, color that we might be familiar with. And this is an early phase that is very important to detect because these are the thicknesses that we can actually do something with. The sheen areas are simply too thin for most conventional methods of uh, collecting the oil, so we, we cannot do anything with them, but the, uh, they all oil over time will become towards this sort of sheen layer. But if we can already collect the data when it's in the metallic phase, then we can actually collect it and get it away from the marine environment. And as a rule of thumb, we can say that more than 90% of the oil volume is contained in less than 10% of the oil spill area. So the, the thicker areas are quite small, whereas the um, thin areas are quite extensive. So we want to be able to target and send out an operational cleanup procedure to the area where we have the thickest oils um, located. So we wish it to be uh, quite simple here, but we said we, SAR has images have some limitations. We have some limitations related to the sensor itself. Uh, that's the noise. So we need to have enough signal to separate it from the background. The incidence angle is changing and the backscatter values change with the incidence angle. We have the spatial coverage. Sometimes the oil spills are very small, then we need to have a very high pixel resolution. Sometimes they're large, then we need to have a large spatial coverage. And we also need to have the temporal coverage. If you want to see how an oil moves over time, we need to have a very high frequency of coverage of data. But there is also some known other limitations of oil spill detection, the so-called lookalikes. We have natural slicks, newly formed sea ice, low wind regions, internal waves, upwelling and algae blooms. And they all tend to look the same as the oil spill. So when we try and have an automatic detection, we have to ensure that we have a method that we can remove all of these things that look like an oil in the SAR images. So just to show you then some, some images here, we have an oil spill in the middle or three types of oil spills, as a matter of fact. We have a crude oil in the lower right of the center image. <laughs> we have an emulsion, and we also, at the top left corner in that image, we have a vegetable oil. So this is from one of those exercises that I talked about where we're trying to find out how can we separate crude oil from vegetable oil or naturally occurring slicks, such as those of algae blooms, which we can see on the, on the right there. So there you can see the, the oil spill in the center and the algae bloom on the right, they look slightly different, but they will be affected in very similar ways by the wind and current. But looking in an optical image, as we can do at the top, they look vastly different. So you would not really confuse this algae bloom with an oil spill if you were given an optical image. But with a SAR image, that's not the same um, thing. And on the left there, we can see some uh, newly formed sea ice. Sometimes also we talk about grease ice. There's a lot of different range of the, the thinner oil or the thinner uh, ice types. And they look similar to the, to the oil spills. So depending on where in the world you are, uh, the problem will also, of course, be of different um, importance to you. If you're in the California area, not likely to have too much of the of the sea ice forming, but you may have a lot of the algae blooms or a biogenic slicks. If we move into the polar context, uh, hazard or sea ice is hazardous for ship traffic and may cause ships to uh, have a catastrophe and start releasing oil. Um, but these areas are also the ones sought uh, by fishing because that's where you have the highest biological productivity and for tourism, because the tourist wants to see the sea ice and possibly also see polar bears or penguins. So you have ships moving in an area that is hazardous to them, um, but at the same time, if there should be a release, we need to be able to separate them from the new ice. 
Algae blooms are obviously occurring mostly during summer conditions and are very common in coastal areas. And coastal areas we already talked about, that's where you have uh, most of the oil uh, spills occurring. And of course, we also have the so-called natural seepages. So this is some natural seepages in the Barents Sea. We have uh, been observing them for many years. There's a lot of methane releases to go with them. And here you can see uh, on the right, hopefully you can see the, the, the curly squirrelies. These are three points where we have near continuous release of oil from the seabed. And they bring with them also methane gas. The images here are 25 by 25 kilometers um, large, just to give you a sort of a scale. And we were having a campaign uh, this summer here of 2022, where uh, we observed and the oil spills also on the sea surface. You can see a picture here on the right of these oil images that you can order, the oil seepages that you also see in the radar image. Unfortunately, there is also biogenic slicks. These biogenic slicks are often quite thin, but you can see an image of a biogenic slick on the left. And you can see here that actually we have the biogenic slicks are in the vicinity of the oil slicks. So we need to be careful when trying to interpret these areas. And this is the Barren Sea. So this area also has a lot of sea ice forming in the wintertime. So wave damping is more important for oil spills than for natural slicks um, in the, the lower frequency bands, whereas natural slicks cause stronger damping in, for example, L-band. And we can sometimes then use multi-frequency radar measurements to look at how they, how the mineral oil slicks and the uh, na natural slicks uh, vary. So now you know a bit more about what slicks actually look like in the radar images. Um, so we know that the roughness and the dielectric properties affect the SAR images. We know that the wind condition and oil slick properties is important if we're going to derive the information or find out the information in the SAR images. But there's also a lot of sensor parameters that we need to be aware of. So let's start with the first one, that is the polarization. So the single polarization SAR has been used since the 1980s to detect oil spills, both operationally and obviously from a scientific perspective. So the images I've shown you before has actually all been single polarization data, or at least I've only shown one of the polarizations in the images. So this is the image we can see here is the VV channel for a Radarsat 2 image. And already here, you can see we can do quite a lot of things. We can detect the area, we can start extracting features, we can start looking at how is the oil spill looking, what kind of shapes does it have, does it vary across the image. And we can do something to look at the oil versus the lookalike classifications, so the, the damping in different frequencies may be uh, changing. And already said that the highest return power is given in the vertical polarization and therefore this is the preferred channel for oil spill detection. So then we also talked about the dielectric properties of the oil is related to the volume fraction on the oil. Uh, but we also know that the thicker oil dampen the surface waves more strongly and we can therefore use the single polarization SAR images to generate maps where the areas of the relatively thicker oil is located. So you can see here in the center, we have the, the sheen, the, the rainbow color. It's related to the thickness of the oil film is caused by the interference of light reflected at the lower and upper boundaries of the thin oil films. But what we want to get to is the, the thicker oil, the ones that we can see at the bottom of this figure. And with the single polarization data, we can calculate the so-called damping ratio or the contrast in backscattering decibels. So this is a reasonably easy parameter to calculate in the sense that you take, you identify an area across the entire image. So you need to account for all the different incidence angle and get the, the clean area. So the area in the image that doesn't have any oil and you divide that simply by the whole image itself. So you can then see how much is the oil damping in across the image. This is particularly useful when we have time series 
and we can identify where we have the thickest oil within the slick. Because remember that the SAR images cannot give us the actual thickness, but it can give us the relative thickness. So we can say, relatively speaking, this downwind area here has the thickest oil. And this parameter is relatively easy to calculate and is fast enough to be done on board, for example, the NASA's UAV SAR plane. And this can be done in near real time. And then the monitoring can be then targeting and flying, continuing flying the plane over the area where we know that we have the thickest uh, spill. And then we can track that, the, the thickest oil, to, because that's where we can do a change and, uh, and collect it. And we know that that may have a slightly different uh, drift pattern as well. So we can use damping ratio to aid the responders for the cleanup operation. And you can see here, we have a mineral oil that's been here colored into two different categories using the damping ratio. We have, so the mineral oil in itself uh, is black. And then when we have identified through using a threshold that we have the thicker mineral oil, we color it in red. And you can see here that most oil is concentrated at the front and the middle part of the field. And it is also related to the drift uh, direction. And particularly here, the wind plays an important role on a surface release. Um, so the wind, as I said, plays in a very important role. Well, many of the parameters are affected by the wind speed. So we know that the detection limitations for oil spills is that we can't really detect them if the winds is below two to three meters per second. And also we have a problem identifying them if the wind speeds are above 10 to 40 meters per second. So I color that range where we have the optimal detection uh, with sort of a light turquoise green blue color. So why do we have these problems? Well, when the wind is too low, remember I talked about we have a lookalike called the low wind areas. So when the wind speed is too low, it's simply not possible to separate the oil spill from the surroundings because all the capillary waves are being dampened when there is no wave or no wind. And if the wind speeds are too high, the oil gets mixed down and into the water column and it reduces the marine surface slick as is. And the damping ratio is also affected by the wind state, where the higher the wind speed, the lower the damping ratio, with some uh, variations. So it's, um, the damping ratio is certainly the highest when we have the lower wind speeds and it gets then reduced uh, with once the wind speed increase up to sort of seven or eight meters per second when it seems to level out. So if you want to sort of look at images from certain areas where we want to monitor the evolution over time, we have within here the Mississippi Canyon 20, MC20, it's in the Mexican Gulf. And if you want to, you can uh, click on this link here and start looking at the report from the area. Oil has been leaking here since Hurricane Ivan hit the area in 2004. It's still uh, continuing. And one way to monitor this continuous release is through SAR images. We can use both airborne and satellite. And it's also a, an excellent area for us to then track and test a lot of these methods that we have developed over time to actually use something that it's not necessarily a nice event in the first place, but we can actually use it for a good cause so that we in the future can learn more about the drift patterns and detectability uh, in both SAR and modeling. And we can then derive this relative thickness estimates, the damping ratio. So here was a campaign with the NASA's UAV SAR plane in November in 2016. As I said, the parameter is mathematically very quick. So it was done on board the plane in near real time. Uh, and the damping ratio is incidence angle dependency is reduced. And we will come back to why this is important later. And we can then set a threshold for oil versus water that depends on the wind state. So the, in the SAR images, we cannot get the, the actual thickness, but we can get the relative thickness between images. And if you start looking here a little bit closer on the images, you can see that we are having a, a green pattern in the first few images. And then if we move towards the later images here, so number seven to nine, <laughs> you can see that some of the areas start looking uh, a bit red in an area where we can see a wave moving through. So the, 
here the wave is helping all accumulate in certain sections and these is typically examples there where we can then send out responders to actually try and and pick up the oil in these regions so with a time series like this we may not be able to say what the actual thickness is but we can uh, look at how the changes are occurring and we can start saying something about the weathering uh, but we cannot take an image from a month or a year later and say ah this is what the this is how the oil has changed because new oil will have been released and therefore we cannot say anything about the the actual thickness from one image to the another when they are very far apart in time so if we want to then compare this the damping ratio values that we can get from from the SAR images with those we can get in optical images. So this is from a reasonably hot off the press. This was a campaign at Santa Barbara in uh, June in 2022, where we then can derive the relative thickness from the SAR images, as we can see here on the left. So where the, the damping ratios we then separated, we cannot say the actual thickness, but we can say where we have relatively thicker oil compared to other areas. And on the right, which is a zoom in, so you can see there is a, a, a rectangle on the on the left image, and then to the right here we have the zoom in, where we have overlaid uh, optical images taken by drones on top of the relative thickness uh, areas in the SAR images. And I hope that you can see that the areas where we have a thicker oil corresponds very well to the areas where we have a relatively higher damping ratio. So we can then see that the relative damping ratio is certainly corresponds to something that we would in the in the bond code agreement or in optical images identify as the thicker oil spills or the thicker oil in within an image. So that is all very well, um, but we have some problems obviously with um, all satellite images. So we can retrieve the relative thickness using one channel in the SAR images. But the oil is a low backscatter target and we need to be very careful with noise contamination in the images. So here's an image again from an oil and water exercise in 2011. There's three different types of oil. We have crude oil, emulsion, and then plant oil as a lookalike. The crude oil here is the thickest oil that we have emulsion is the thinnest of the mineral oils. And looking at the image on the left, we have the pink dotted line is the so-called noise floor or the noise equivalent sigma zero. So this is where 50% of what we receive in the SAR image is noise and 50% is signal. And here we have also identified or extracted regions of interest from the, the plant oil, the emulsion, the crude oil, and also the open water. And as you can see, the open water here is blue because it's open water and it is well situated well above the noise floor. So these data, we know that they are primarily signal. But when we look at the crude oil, which is the data seen in black, we can see that some of the data here is actually below the noise floor and most of it is quite close to the noise floor in itself. I said the VV has a higher return than the HH. You can hopefully see that a little bit, that the um, stars or the are situated slightly above the diamonds on, on these bars. But this is the case now for the co-polarization channels, so the HH and VV. If we move to the cross-polarization channels, there we can see that the backscatter values are significantly lower. So this is from the same image. And you can see here that the mean values, which is indicated by the symbol in the center of these bars, the mean values are situated below the noise floor levels. And so the noise, there's a high noise cross-contamination in all the cross-polarized channels here. And if we have a very poor signal-to-noise ratio, as we will have in this instance, we cannot separate the thicker areas from the thinner areas because we are we're dealing primarily with noise. And this means that we need to be quite careful when we're looking at the SAR images so that we do not accidentally say that this is a very homogeneous area if what in fact we're looking at that, yes, we have managed to detect the oil spill, but we cannot separate 
be different thicknesses because of noise contamination in the data. So different sensors has different noise floor. And for example, the Terrasar X image that we can see here on the left has a higher noise floor than, for example, the Radarsat 2 images that we can see on the right. And the Terrasar X image here was acquired in HH and VV dual polarization mode. So most of the data is still actually above the noise floor. Uh, but for the Radarsat 2 data, the cross polarization values are partially below the noise floor and the mean values are quite close to the noise floor. So here, if we would use um, the HV channels to derive information about these slicks, we need to be quite careful so that we don't accidentally interpret something that isn't quite there. So these two are two satellite-borne sensors, but we are also using um, airborne sensors, such as the UAVSAR sensor that I talked about before. And if we compare the Terrasar X data here with the UAVSAR data, we can see here that even the cross polarization channel in the UAVSAR data is situated well above the noise floor. And this means that we can actually even use this channel to derive information about the oil spill characteristics. So that was the polarization. I've also already now hinted a bit about the sense of noise being important, but I also shown you different frequencies. And the different frequencies have different advantages when it comes to the SAR oil spill detections. So we have many different satellites and airborne platforms that are used for operational oil spill detection. We have the TerraSAR X, we have the Radarsat 2, and also the UAV SAR uh, from NASA. And you can see here these images are taken very close in time to one another. And with only a separation of a few minutes, but the oil spills look quite different. So, and here is from a slightly different campaign. This is a different sensor. So here we have an airborne campaign. There's an X band, an S band, and an L band uh, time series of an oil slick and how it evolves. And to the right, we have the X band time series. No, to the left, sorry, we have the X band time series. And to the right, we have the L band time series. An X-band we're using because it is renowned for its good detection abilities due to a very good contrast between the oil and the open water. But it comes with a disadvantage that it has a higher noise floor than, for example, the L-band images. So here, if you have both, you can actually start saying a little bit more. You might use the X-band for the separation between the open water and the oil slick. And you can maybe then use the L band to start deriving information about the relative thicknesses. Because for these images here, they are airborne data. So all of them has a reasonably high signal to noise um, ratio. Uh, when it comes to space borne sensors, we, the noise floor is uh, not as good as an airborne sensors. Um, and when we have time series like this, we can also observe the drift pattern as well as change in thickness. And here, we can see the drift pattern is governed by uh, the wind, and it is thicker uh, downwind. So that was a very short coverage of the frequency. We can detect oil in all different frequencies, but they come with certain different pros and cons. The incidence angle, on the other hand, that is a constant um, problem or something that we need to be aware of, regardless of which frequency and polarization we're dealing with. So, because the radar backscatter is reduced with increased incidence angle. And smooth targets, like the one we are, we are studying here, have a sharp drop also in the radar return when we have an increased uh, incidence angle. So, you can see here, I uh, used the UAV SAR data because here we are well above the, the noise floor. But uh, you can see here that the higher the incidence angle, the lower the backscatter radar return is. And also, the higher the incidence angle, the higher the noise floor values. So the noise floor is indicated here by the, the black line at the bottom of the image uh, in, this, in the VV decibel scale. And the uh, oil spill uh, backscatters are in various different colorful uh, lines. And work has shown that in order to be able to derive the information in a safe way where we know that the data has not been uh, contaminated by noise, it needs to be at least 10 decibels above the noise floor. 
So here you can see the, the huge advantage of having something like the UAV SAR. We are, are in this uh, beautiful range of 10 decibels above the noise floor. I'm using this data here also to show you, because the UAV SAR data has a large incidence angle range for many of the satellite sensors, you may be limited to a much smaller range. Uh, but here you can now see the, the change with, with the incidence angle and the radar backscatter response. But not just the, uh, the backscatter values are affected by changes in incidence angle. Uh, well, here we first have the, the VV channel. You can see that one. We saw it already on the previous slide how it changes. The cross-polarization data, just seen below here, indicated as XX. There we have changes with the uh, incidence angle, but you can see that the noise floor values here change dramatically with the incidence angle. So when we get to the, to the higher incidence angles, we actually do not have a very good separation between the signal and the noise. Um, so the difference between the open water here and the uh, oil spills. But we can use these um, backscatter values to derive other parameters, such as on the lower right, we have the copole ratio. So this is the HH channel divided by the VV channel, and they're given in decibels. And here we can also see in this image, difference between the upwind and the downwind leg. We will not focus on, on that here, but you can see how the, the backscatter or the values in this parameter changes with the incidence angle. So if you want to compare two different images, you need to also know where in the incidence angle range you are so that you're comparing apples and apples. And there are various different means that we can adjust for the incidence angle dependency and try and sort of smoothen this curve out. And in the top right here, you can also see a polarimetric feature, the so-called real part of the co-polarized cross product. The name in itself is not necessarily very important here, but there are when we have fully polarimetric data, we can derive a lot of different per, um, polarimetric parameters, and they also have this incidence angle dependency. So we do not get away from it. We always need to consider it when we're looking at, especially the dark uh, backscatter um, phenomena like the oil spills. So, and finally, we have been now be looking at sensor parameters such as the polarization, the frequency, and the incidence angle, but also the resolution and the sensor noise is important. Uh, so, when we are having the UAV SAR sensors, we know that we the thicker oil has a higher damping ratio, and we know that the noise floor is good enough here that we can actually identify these thicker areas. If we're poor signal to noise ratio, we might not be able to. The UAV SAR also has the advantage that it has a very high pixel resolution. So hence the resolution comes in here. We can then identify quite small slicks uh, within the images. The UAV SAR has a resolution of seven meters. So after we have multi-locked images, uh, if we're looking towards operational uh, sensors being used, such as the Sentinel-1 over open water, they use the extended wide mode where we're looking at a 14, 50 meter pixel resolution instead. But the UAV SAR has, and it has a large incidence angle range, so we need to definitely pay attention to where in the image we are to correct for the incidence angle. But the swath throughs are only 22 kilometers wide, so if we have a, a large slick such as the one you can see here from MC20 area, the plane needs to go many times to cover the entire slick. So what do we do then when we're using single polarization data for oil spill classification? Well, we use both the SAR images and the auxiliary information. From the SAR images themselves, we first extract information about the area, the shape, the width, the complexity. And on the right here, you see a Cosmos SkyMed image that includes both low wind areas, natural slicks, as well as oil spills. So this is something that the operational services are often faced with. You can see that the low wind areas, they're quite often very extensive. So for operational oil classification, it's based on the SAR images and auxiliary information. So from the SAR image itself, we can derive the information about the geometry and the shape. So they were thinking about the area, the perimeter, the width, the complexity of the image. And we also care about the backscatter characteristics of the dark spot and its surroundings. We're looking at mean values, the standard deviation, how much does the does the, um, the dark area change uh, within the dark area region? 
what's the gradients like, what's the contrast. We look for feathering effects, which is a known uh, oil spill characteristics. So if we look at the image to the right here, it's a Cosmos SkyMed image where we have both natural slicks, we have low wind, and we have also oil spills. So when we want to separate them, we know that often, quite often low wind areas are quite extensive. They have shapes that many oil spills may not have. We can look for frontal patterns. Quite often you can see a front coming in uh, with the wind patterns. And we also know that low wind areas can be generated by mountains. Uh, so there, if we know the wind direction, we might actually be able to say something about, OK, the wind is coming from this direction. Therefore, we know we often have these streaks coming off the island. Natural slicks, they often form very thin slicks, and sometimes as thin as one molecule only. But both the oil and the natural slicks are affected by the wind and the currents, and might have, but have, may have different complexities. Or the oil spills or the, can occur year round, whereas the natural slicks may only occur at certain times of the year. We can therefore look at sort of contextual information, um, such as also proximity to shore, time of year, or the ships, platform, pipelines in the area. So in Norway, for example, low concentration of oil releases are allowed under given certain conditions from platforms. Therefore, we may know that, okay, it is very, this has been an observation close to a platform. This is probably okay because it's something that they are legally allowed to do. What we want to find is those very thick oils that we can do something about. We also can have wind sensors and a lot of oil spill platforms they actually have wind sensors and we can use them to get more information about the, the region. Are we actually dealing with a low wind um, event now or are the wind speeds quite high but we still observe something? This can be used in, as a contextual information. So once an oil has, spill has been detected in open water, we want to know where will it go. So we need then to modeling of the oil behavior, the transportation and its fate. And here we can use time series to follow the drift. We've done so on, in the annual oil and water exercise in Norway in 2015. It was a campaign where we released uh, a few drifters. Two of them are the so-called ice fairs. You can see them on the as this really big yellow ball uh, in the picture on the right. And we release them because these will be taken by the wind. So they will drift in the way the wind uh, is taking them. But we also release two so-called self-locating data marker buoys. And they are submerged. You can see they barely stick out of the water and they will follow the current drift. And by releasing them, we can then start finding out about the behavior of the drift patterns. Uh, so you see in the image here is the Google Earth image on the on the lower left. So the two boys were released at the same time as the oil spills were released. And the ice fair ones, is, which is the red and the blue uh, curves, you can see they uh, started drifting off to the right. Um, going a little bit up and a little bit down, but this is how the wind were pushing these drifters. Whereas these LDMBs or SLDMBs, a self-locating date to market boys, they drift with the currents and they started going south. So here we can see then that the currents and the wind will take the oil in different direction. And therefore, in any modeling, we need to account for both of these two phenomena. So during this campaign, we then did research on detecting how the different oil types were and how we can distinguish them both in the drift pattern and how we can see them in the SAR images. So the drifters were released in a, uh, the plant oil slick and in one of the emulsions to provide position and sea surface temperatures at 10 minute intervals. At the same time, the NASA UAV SAR plane were continuously flying over the area um, for about eight hours with a short break in the middle for refueling. And this means when we have 22 quad polarimetric SAR scenes that cover this area at the same time as we have the drift patterns. And here you can see what those images look like. Um, so there is a, the first two rows and part of the third row are from the first set of flights and then the plane had to go back and refuel and come back for a later um, continued monitoring. And this means that we can see some, some changes here. The first, the top three slicks are 
mineral oil slicks and the bottom one is a plant oil slick. And I hope that you can already start noticing some changes in the uh, evolution of these slicks. There are such things as well, the plant oil and the, the smallest emulsions, which consist of 60% water and only 40% oil. Once uh, we had been four hours into the uh, campaign or from the slicks were released, the plant oil and the, uh, the E40, as it's called, were more difficult to detect. But you can also start noticing the shape. So where the, the emulsion slicks here, the E80 and E60, so 80% oil and 20% water, they've actually become quite elongated and they're spreading uh, downwind. With the, so the wind direction goes basically from the left of this image to the right of the images. Whereas the plant oil is still sort of confined in a little blob. So given all these measurements, we could use the UAV SAR data repeats to tune the oil drift model. And here we use the Met Norway's open oil drift model. It's openly available for anyone who wants to get their hands on it and try to track their own uh, oil spills. And it's specifically designed to track marine oil slicks. So we tune it to fit the UAV star measurements. The oil represent, is represented by particles and these are seeded with the contours from the UAV star. And then we use the drift measured by the drifters. We get both the wind and the current drifts. So the horizontal movement, we get the ambient currents from the, 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 the submerged drifter and the ocean model and also wave induced uh, Stokes drift. So the Stokes drift is where we would say the ocean surface experience a net Stokes drift velocity in the direction of the wave propagation. And we also assume that we have a, roughly a windage of about 2% of the surface wind. And then the vertical movements, that's when the, water, the oil particles get mixed down. That is done by, for example, wave breaking. And then the rise of these particles is due to the buoyancy. And if you want to find out much more about how this study was done, I recommend you to go and look at the Jones et al. 2016 paper. And there's the reference to it at the end of the presentation as well. So this is what these um, model runs look like. So we have now the relative position, extent and spread that we can follow for these eight hours. And at the lower right, you can see the plant oil. So it is much more confined to a smaller area. Uh, if we compare to the to the oil, uh, the mineral oil slicks, which are much more sort of spread out and not as as confined over time. And because we were there, we know what kind of oil was released, and we also know that the oil spill thickness was somewhere between 0.5 and 8 microns. So from this, we could then start looking even further into the drift behavior. So by combining the SAR and the modeling, we notice the particles located close to the surface, they drift faster eastwards. And those who were situated far below the surface, they drift westwards. And we could then see that the bulk of the plant oil was below the surface and that was shielded from the strong eastward Stokes drift and the surface wind, which is why it kept on being resurfacing on the same area by and large, whereas the oil was then being spread much, uh, much more uh, away from the original point when we had this elongated track. So then we can see the trajectories is mainly steered by the currents and is in agreement with the UAV SAR observations. So then if we start looking at that with a vertical or like with depth here, we can see the difference in the depth profiles is found and then indicating a potential for the slick discrimination based on the transportation, well, we can actually then see that the plant oil has behaved very differently and is much more further down into the column than, for example, the oil emulsion. So by combining then the drift modeling and the SAR observations, we can then start seeing something that we can use maybe continuous data from different SAR sensors to actually see, okay, the, this particular area is drifting in a way that we don't expect an oil spill to drift in. So maybe some words about why do we have all of these test experiments? Well, they are done under control conditions. We know how much oil it is. 
and we can transfer this knowledge to unknown areas. So I've already talked before about this natural uh, seeps of gas and mineral oil uh, in the Barren Sea shelf. It is a very extensive area and it is a lot of oil being released. It's primarily methane gas being released, but the oil is accompanying uh, this methane gases and actually aids the methane gas to get from the seabed up to the, to the atmosphere by shielding the methane gas in oil-coated bubbles. And these slicks are very thin, but with repeat observations, we can actually track them. And these thin slicks are some type of slicks that we don't know uh, as much about as the thicker oils and how they move. And we also, the detection limitations for these thin slicks in the satellite images are unknown. And said before then, the drift patterns are unclear. So by having these experiments, we can start deriving information about areas where we, where we know nothing about uh, at this point in time. So how can we do that? Well, we take here then the backscatter images. As you can see on the left, this is a, a radar SAT-2 image from this summer. We can calculate then the damping ratio so we know where the thickest oil is. Um, and then, so that is a sort of solid green, uh, dark red areas. And then we put this into the drift modeling. And then we can see, can we actually, using the, this, the backscatter and damping ratio input, can we then estimate the correct drift pattern. So here we initiated the model a bit before uh, this particular image was taken to see can we actually recreate the drift pattern as it was seen in the SAR image when it was taken. And yes, uh, very happily I can report that we could do that and it looks um, very good, I think. Um, what we have to be a bit careful here about is that when when we try and predict into the future, as we try to do here, is of course that if we get, we need to use wind and current information that has not yet occurred, we're using forecasting. So if the forecasting is wrong, then our drift modeling will also be wrong. But given the known conditions, we could actually recreate the values uh, or the drift patterns quite well. So there are some data types that are not used operationally. So we lack data. And if we have a known time and location, they are essential for then acquisition planning. This is why we also do these test experiments. We need then access to ground truth. We do then the all type and the properties, and we know the environmental conditions. So here's again some examples from a campaign a few years ago, where you can see this is an optical image taken from a plane. And then we can use remote sensing both from Spaceborne and aircraft data. And we can then determine the SAR characteristics when we know what's happening on the ground. And we can then start trying to use this data to derive the, SAR the oil characteristics. So I said at the start here, we are interested in getting the volume, but we also want to actually know what type of oil are we looking at. So the oil and water exercise in North Sea are a unique opportunity to collect this kind of data. We have been using different oil types. We have the crude oil here, we have the emulsions, um, and we have the plant oil. And these images are fully polarimetric images, and sometimes we use the dual polarimetric HH and BV combination to get away from the problem with the noise. And having this polarimetric data, we can derive more information. And we have actually seen that we can use this kind of data to separate different oil types. So I know that some of you at least should have had some uh, lectures before about the SAR, um, about SAR and then scattering matrices, the covariance matrix and the coherence matrix. I will not go into that here. There are many good SAR books out there that you can use for this otherwise. But we can use these the scattering matrix to derive the covariance and the coherence matrix, and we can use that for decomposition and polarimetric feature extracting. So at the bottom, you have the VV intensity of these oil slicks that we looked at now many times. But we have also derived the entropy, which is one of those decompositions. And here you can see that the oil slicks look quite different. And we can then use this to interpret a change in scattering mechanisms between the clean sea, the oil, and the lookalike on here, the plant oil. 
can also use the core polarization power ratio. So the VV divided by the, also the HH divided by the VV channel. And through the tilted um, Bragg model, which I think has also been covered in earlier lectures, this is a parameter we like to do because it, according to the tilted Bragg model, the roughness in the polarization independent, it's polarization independent and it will cancel out. And the co-polarization power ratio then only depends on the incidence angle, the dielectric constant, and the tilt angles. And we've seen that it is possibly useful for estimating the motion water content. So we can actually then start saying how much oil is in this um, oil slick and how much of it has already been emulsified. And here is a colorful image then to show a range of different multipolarization features that has been proposed over time for different oil spill characterizations. So you have the entropy, the alpha angle, and the anisotropy, so the HA alpha decomposition. And you can see here that the, the alpha angle, maybe it's not so easy to separate the different oil spills, but in the entropy and the anisotropy, we have quite different characteristics depending on if it's in crude oil or if it's a plant oil. And you also have the the co-polarization power ratio down here, the correlation magnitude, is a whole range of different parameters. But two of the parameters has proven to be rather useful is the geometric intensity and the real part of the co-polarized cross product. They're all a bit of a mouthful to, to say, I have to admit, but uh, if we use them and then derive the histograms from these uh, two features for the different uh, types of oil and open water, we can see there are some promising results to separate the different classes. We can see here that the, the mineral oils, so the emulsion and the crude oil, are largely overlapping for the real part of the polarized cross product, whereas the plant oil has a different distribution in its histogram and again very different from the open water. And a similar um, result can be seen in the geometric intensity. So these parameters indicate that they can probably be used to then separate the lookalikes from one another, as well as separating the dark features from the open water areas. And we've seen that multipolarization features have shown better contrast and region discrimination in Radarsat 2 uh, data compared to Terrasar X data. So here's the same oil spills taken quite close in time about 16 minutes time separation, but you can see here we have different incidence angles. And remember, we talked that the incidence angle will be important when it comes to how good the data quality may be and also what the backscatter values will be. But here we can see that there is a larger separation in the radar star 2 than in the Terrasar X between the crude oil and emulsion compared to the other types. So, and the multiparameter features, they can also be then related to the surface properties and the scattering behavior in the SAR images. But the proximity to the noise floor, even here we have a UV SAR image here, but the proximity to the noise floor can affect the polarimetric features and the interpretation of the results. So we need to be quite careful when we get close to the noise floor, that because particularly for oil spills here, the entropy values when we're close to the noise floor will actually have very high entropy values, which would normally indicate we have volume scattering. But uh, we are in fact not having volume scattering, we're seeing an effect of noise contamination in the parameter retrieval. So hopefully some take home messages for you uh, at the end of this lecture. So oil dampens capillary waves. This is why we have the low backscatter areas in the SAR images. We need to be careful about sensor specifics, such as the incidence angle and the noise floor. They will affect the detection and monitoring capabilities of the SAR sensors and the SAR in the SAR images. We can do a lot even with single and dual parametric SAR data for detection and monitoring of oil slicks. We can, for example, derive the damping ratio. We can identify areas of different oil thickness and we can identify areas of oil slicks to initiate oil drift modeling. So where does the oil slick go? And we can use time series for oil slicks of oil slicks from satellites and airborne campaigns for recovery procedures. 
and I just touched very quickly upon it, the quad polar metric images can also be used to derive all slick characteristics. So I hope you're now all eager to start detecting your own oil spills. Um, so I think here there will be provided a um, data. You can even you can also download the data. There's a Sentinel-1 freely available image uh, on any of the portals that provide the Sentinel-1 images. This is an image over a oil slick in the Mediterranean with some ship colliding here. So here um, you can use the software Snap, which is a freely open um, software. And here you can, uh, if you open this image here, you can see a little bit on the on the image at the corner here, uh, the area which contains the oil spill in the first place. So in order to speed up the procedures, you first do a quick look in the images and you have to then subset to a region that doesn't also contain land. This will speed up the processing time. And to do this, you open the snap and you then open Go to raster, which is a drop down at the top, and then go to subset. And then you get the image you see here on the right. So if you click on the on bands and then intensity in VV, you will then see an image at least looking similar to the one that I have here on the left. In order for your SAR detection, you need, now need to perform some speckle filtering. So again, you go to the drop down menus on radar and speckle filtering. And a Lee Sigma filter is a very good starting point. There are also other options you can choose. But here I've just stuck with the standard settings. So a window size of 7 by 7 and number of looks set to 1. So then you want to convert the, value, the intensity values into decibels. You can actually then start seeing a little bit what are the backscatter values looking like. And here you may want to then make a line or shift in backscatter intensity values that we'll be using then to extract the, the slick from the surrounding areas. And for this, you need to go to analysis and then do a profile plot. And then you can make a line using the, the sort of line with a little cross at the end symbol, which is what I've done here in the image on the left. So you can then see my little line in, in yellow and then you can see what the sigma VV uh, values in decibel are for that line. And then we can now run. So SNAP actually has an automatic oil spill detection tool. So you go to radar and then SAR applications, ocean applications, and then oil spill detection. In there, you need to set the background window dimensions and a threshold shift. So here I picked a value of two decibels, which was similar to what I could see when I made my line. And I kept the background window dimension here to one kilometer. And then you press run, and then you get these results here. So you can now see the sigma VV value uh, when you click on the band there. And then you can also see the sigma VV all spill bit misc which is the oil spill pixels and areas that has now been detected using this automatic uh, oil spill detection uh, part of the SNAP algorithm, or the SNAP software. And once you now have this mask, you can now start calculating your own uh, statistics from the oil spill and start deriving parameters such as the damping ratio uh, all by yourself and start seeing if you can also identify the areas where you have the thickest oil spills in this particular image. Yeah, so there has been a lot of good work done over the years. Here is just a snapshot of some of the references that you can go and look at if you want to learn more about oil spills. These are all been examples from all of these ones have been used in, in the slides. So I'm very thankful for everyone who's taken the effort to write these papers in the first place. And I should also have a huge thank in my acknowledgement here to Kathleen Jones, Camilla Brecke, Martina Espeset, and Stinus Krunas, who have all contributed slides to this presentation. No for the Norwegian Clean Seas Association for Operating Companies, who has allowed us to participate in the oil and water exercises over the years and 
has also adjusted their release schedules to fit with the satellite image acquisition so that we could have the best possible data. And then also, of course, to all of those who participated in this marine oil field, spill, field work and Kongsberg Satellite Service, who has also provided us with satellite data for these campaigns over the years. Yeah, and thank you for your attention, and I hope you have enjoyed this lecture. Thank you very much for that great presentation, Dr. Johansson. Please, for those that have questions, write them in the question box and we will be answering them shortly in the order that they were received. We will post the Q&A document on the training site for this uh, webinar series in a couple of days. And here is Dr. Johansson's contact information if you have any questions regarding the material presented today. And this concludes this final session of this webinar series. Thank you very much to all participants, to Dr. Johansson, and we are now ready to start the question and answer session. Okay, so we have been collecting your questions so far and we have uh, gathered them in this Google, Google Doc that you see. So let's just start uh, working our way down through the questions. Uh, so the first question, what other fluids can we detect using SAR? Can we detect other types of water pollution? Go ahead, Dr. Johansson. Uh, hello, I hope you can all still hear me. Yes, absolutely. Loud and yeah. clear. Yeah, so uh, fluids are a little bit of a nemesis for SAR images. We, they are often a problem both for if we want to work with vegetation and we want to work in glaciers and all of these areas, because as soon as something gets wet, uh, the radar signature immediately drops and we uh, can certainly detect them and they obscure many other things that we would like to be able to do. So water is one of those fluids that we definitely can detect. But I assume here we're also working with the, the water pollution uh, topic. So any fluid that reduces the capillary waves, we can detect in SAR images. But of course, such a fluid must have a lower density than the water, because otherwise it will locate it below the surface and we cannot see them because the, the radar signature cannot penetrate the, the ocean surface. So for most times when we are looking at water pollution, uh, the main uh, source that we're using is optical images. So SAR is great, but that is not the main, uh, or that's not the main satellite sensors we're using, unfortunately. Great, thank you. The next question, number two. In 2000. 10, the Deepwater Horizon spill resulted in oil entering the coastal wetlands of southeast Louisiana. Is it possible to monitor oil within the wetlands where, where SAR results in a double bounce return? Can SAR detect oil in a beach or a rocky shoreline or other surfaces? Yes, I was. I saw some presentations a number of years ago now where they used SAR images and they used optical images to look at particularly the Deepwater Horizon spill. Um, I have been uh, trying to find this uh, this information now or some presentations, but I, I have been coming up with a blank, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, maybe so, at a, I'm sorry. Maybe at a later time we can include some links. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll do my absolute best. I saw some some good work, at least initially, uh, when I tried to use this also to identify areas where they were going to go and try and, and uh, retrieve as much of the oil as possible. Um, so I think it's possible. Um, but yeah, I couldn't find any of the information right now. Um, so rocky shorelines, so the reason why we want to use SAR is that because they reduce the uh, the damp in the surface capillary waves. And once you get to these rocky shorelines and these kind of really coastal areas, we are, we are a little bit of a problem. We get too much um, interference in the signal also from the coastal coastal regions. So it's um, it's a bit challenging, I would say.
Okay, question number three. L band is showing the least oil detection capabilities. What is the reason for this? Oh, so it's simply that L band has a, a longer wavelength than the other frequencies. Though, it, yeah, so it, it's not as well as to be able to detect the, the oil spills, but as you, I hope you saw now in uh, a lot in the presentations that I, uh, or the examples that I gave, that the L band has an amazing uh, signal to noise ratio compared to the other frequencies. And as such, um, the L band is often very good for continuous monitoring and sometimes also detection. Um, especially if we're in low wind regions. And there was a, a second part to this question. What is the, that, that I didn't read, what is the best band to detect oil spills? X band, S band, or L band, or I guess C band as well? Um, yeah, so I mean, X band has been shown, I think already back in the uh, mid 1990s to be very good for, for the, the, particularly the delineation and the detection of the, on the oil spills. So from that perspective, the X-band is, is really great. Um, the X-band sensors unfortunately comes with a, a little bit of a poor uh, signal to noise ratio. So that is certainly one of the disadvantages. All right, question number four, can we apply an integral equation method dielectric model to classify oil spills? So this question had me a little bit. I have been Googling now trying to, to find uh, an answer to this. Um, I've seen some work that has um, looked into this particular problem, but um, otherwise we see there's some great work done by Brent Minshew when he tried to then separate oil with different thicknesses, when we try to look at sheens or emulsions with different, uh, to try to extract the dielectric constant from them and then use this to separate different oil types. Um, but I am, I've seen reasonably recently some work on the integral equation methods and I would assume that it's possible, but I haven't seen an awful lot of work on it, unfortunately. Okay, question number five. Can we use thermal IR images in the very shallow coastal regions to identify the oil spill area? Um, so we certainly can use thermal infrared images um, because they are sensitive to the oil thickness and its presence. Uh, so I just pointed towards a bit of a review paper by Fingas. Uh, he'd done some previous work as well, but this one here I, I pointed towards the 2018 paper because it's open access, everyone should be able to read it. Um, yes, it's been used for a long time, the thermal uh, images for this, but I'm, I'm primarily working with SAR, so thermal images in very shallow uh, regions, um, I think so, but uh, <laughs> if anyone is out there who would like to correct me and say that that's not possible, feel, feel very free to do so. Great. Question number six. How do how do you estimate the noise equivalent sigma naught? Do you need to calculate any SN for each image? Uh, so I assume it means noise equivalent sigma zero here. And yeah, you need to calculate for uh, every image. Um, I'm, some of the SAR images, they contain the information as some in the metadata. So such as Radarsat 2 and Sentinel-1 images, there you simply go to the metadata file and you extract it. Um, you need to know roughly uh, how you're doing, but there's great sources on online to, to help you find the, uh, the best way to identify it. Um, some of the other images there, you need to identify some predefined parameters available in the metadata um, or some predefined ways of doing the calculation. And then you go to the provided metadata and you find these parameters and you, you derive the uh, noise equivalent sigma zero values. And yes, you need to derive them for all images. We can for, for some images, if you're using the same sensor mode setup, then you can be reasonably confident that the the profile for your image is going to be the same as the one if you had exactly the same configuration uh, earlier. Something to be a little bit cautious about with some of these things is that sometimes the satellite service data providers 
have identified a, a bug in the system, they come up with a better way of estimating um, the signal and the noise values in their sensor. So I've had examples where a later version of the image actually then contain a much improved um, value so that uh, when we try to compare our results with the new results, we were a bit uh, surprised, but that was simply an update in the in the noise floor uh, values and in the signal values. Okay, question number seven. You mentioned rainbow, sheen, and metallic. Based on the image that was on the slide, is it correct that sheen is always on the edge of the oil spill? If correct, then based on the difficulty in the detection of sheen, can we create a buffer around the oil spill region to make sure that the sheen is captured effectively every time? So uh, sheen is the thinnest uh, of, uh, so it's also often, often most located in the edges of the oil spills, uh, for sure. It's, it's the thinnest one of all the types. So um, sometimes though you will have the spreading of the oil where it starts spreading out in slightly uh, new and imaginative ways where the thicker oil might in certain areas drift a little bit faster than the, the thinner oils you might have spreading. So then over time the locations of the sheen may not just be, it may be at the edges of the slit, but if you have elongated fingers it might be at the edges of these fingers instead. So yeah, but creating a buffer zone around them. Question is of course how large should that buffer zone be? So I hope you saw the images where you can see that the thickest oil is normally at the center and at the at the front of the in the motion or the moment of the oil spill. So probably you would then have a, a larger buffer zone um, further away from the front of the of the oil spill or the oil slick. But yeah, it should be possible. And then when we send our rescue response to things, they can obviously they can deal with the uh, with the thicker oil east is you will direct them towards that but they are also aware and look around in the area where they're in to see what's possible in other regions as well okay question number eight if oil spills in an arctic or polar region at the beginning of winter or when the uh, the sea starts to freeze what will be the scenario how is that going to affect the backscatter or the dielectric state Right, so I tried to, there is a paper by Camilla Brecke from 2014, um, which I can maybe can provide the link for, for later, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Um, maybe I'll just try and see if I can put it in. Uh, yeah, so where they looked at, so depending a little bit on when ice starts freezing, it will, the initial oil will, or the initial, um, uh, let's see, oh, wrong. Uh, so the dielectric constant will vary depending on how cold the area is and of course the incidence angle but also then if it's sea ice if it's new ice young ice or if it's oil and ice in combination so the backscatter areas well if the if the new ice and the oil is in the same region that will have a a quite uh, of course it will combine jointly or reduce the uh, the capillary waves um so and it will change the dielectric state as well so the oil emulsion uh, if it's in ice it will be having a slightly higher for example copal ratio than the um if it was just uh if it was just ice or sorry just oil so uh, we provide the link to this um, paper afterwards there's also been some a lot of very good work done by um, Firosi in Canada and others who have looked into how the, if you then start mixing the ice and the oil and how that will affect the backscatter and the electric state as well. Okay, question number nine. 
Which software would you recommend to use if one has a time series of SAR images on oil spills? Is Snap able to handle time series data? Uh, yeah, Snap can handle time series. You set up a batch processing. So yeah, it's possible. Um, of course, if you are uh, really great in programming in Python and things, you can set up a time series analysis there as well. But yeah, it's definitely possible in, in Snap to do so, yes. Wonderful. Question 10. Does the extraction strategy change with the thickness of the oil? If so, can you briefly elucidate the oil extraction process? Uh, oh, wow. Um, depending on what type of oil, how thick it is, what your the environmental conditions are like, you will uh, Employ different strategies. So some of the uh, more, how to say, it, environmental friendly oils. So the oils that have a lower sulfur content, they are very uh, thick. They are not great at all to pick up with uh, the present extraction methods that we're having. They they simply clog up the systems. So if you know you have one of those types, you will then maybe try and deploy a different. A lens or a different buoy or a different uh, simple system to extract the oil. Um, uh, how this system and process quite works, I've only ever seen videos. There's a lot of great work out there. Um, so, um, but thinner oils, you may um, just try and sort of collect them. Uh, thicker oils, if you need them to be picked up or you might have to make a decision that you're going to put them on fire that's one of the most common ways of of fighting the oil is basically burning it okay um, next... but... oh, I'm, I'm sorry yep. Go ahead. Oh, no. okay the next question number 11 can you do these analyses on inland water bodies or large, wide river systems? Absolutely. So, yeah, what sort of challenges do they present? Uh, ooh. I mean, a large inland water body is, in a sense, not very different from a an open ocean. I mean, especially if we're talking about something like the Great Lakes or, for me, being from Sweden, some of the Swedish lakes, they are, they're basically inland oceans. So we're then having the same uh, problems or so. Uh, obviously, we're dealing with fresh water, so the dielectric constant in the water would be uh, slightly different. But we're still looking at the differences between the, the oil and the water ones. So uh, For river systems, um, well, some of them, depending on the size of them, is, of course, if you're having reasonably small rivers, if you're simply having too few uh, pixels and you have a lot of contaminations from the, the size of the river, that will be one of your biggest problems. Okay. The next question, how do you identify the noise contamination in the image and how do you determine it using the SNAP software? Oh, for um, quite a lot of images, you can often just simply open up the HV channel in SNAP and look at it. Um, if the noise contamination is severe, you're going to see kind of striping effects going across the image. And you can see where the different bands are located, especially if you're looking at Sentinel images, Sentinel-1 images. So you will, first of all, you will see like edges between the different beams that has been uh, used to combine the SAR image. Um, what I often do is I find out what the noise floor values or the noise profile for my specific image is. And then I compute that. And then I also compute, obviously, the, the normalized rate of backscatter for the SAR image. And I simply make a, one minus the other to 